now we have the diagnostic test that can tell us a bit more accurately about the lung symptoms. Don't forget, in, in our clinical judgment of the best lung transplant program in the world, we thought all those lungs were good. And yet, we do have morbidities, we do have mortality, there's information there that we don't have. And so we've been working with industry partners, and, and now there's a way that we can get this answer done in less than two hours, and we're pushing them to say we need the answer in less than one hour, because we, time is of essence. We need to be able to get these answers so that we can use these tests for uh, clinical decision-making. So taking it to the next step, if we find that something's wrong with the organ, we're not just looking for a reason not to do a lung transplant, but what we want to do is say, if these lungs are good, we should transplant. If there's something wrong with the lung, can we diagnose the injury and can we repair the injury of these lungs? And we've shown this, and this is work we started 10 years ago. Fowler Martins is a thoracic surgery uh, fellow from Brazil who worked in the lab. He did some very nice work that was published in Nature Gene Therapy. And what Fowler showed is that we could take the um, common cold virus, adenovirus, take the guts out of that virus, take its genes out, and put the IL-10 gene into that virus, and use the virus to take the IL-10 gene into the lung cells and make the lung work better. So what Fowler did was he transduced the donor lung with the adenoviral IL-10, stored the lungs for 24 hours, and then did a transplant in a pig, and the, and the lungs that were treated with the gene therapy did significantly better than the control lungs, which were just stored cold or deep sick. So that is a major step, and it's the first proof that we can genetically modify the donor lung to do better after you transplant it. Now, there are problems with it. We have to treat the lungs for cell virus in the donor, and we don't always have cell virus to work with our donor. And secondly, we were concerned about side effects, timing, and how do you tell that the lung is getting better over time? So uh, we, we looked at ways to treat the lung outside the body. That would be ideal. But as I mentioned, in our standard techniques, when you cool them down, you shut everything down. The gene expression is also shut down. So you can't turn on these helpful genes. So we started to look for ways to how can we keep the lungs outside the body at normal body temperature so that we can assess the lung, diagnose it, focus on recovery, which many lungs can do on their own given time, and then look at treatment of, uh, using novel therapies. And also, the fact that we could treat the organs outside the body gives us the ability to use some techniques that you might not be able to use in a patient, but you can use outside the body. And more importantly, there's tests out there. If you find out that some, something's wrong with the lung, you can fix it, retest it, and confirm that it's okay and safe to use before you actually use it. And this isn't a new concept. Charles Lindbergh, the same Lindbergh of the flight, uh, uh, in, published in Science in 1935, the concept of keeping organs in sort of like a cell culture system where there's n nutrients and the right temperature and ways to clear wa waste from the cells. And he drew these elaborate or, uh, diagrams. There's a, there's a heart in this system uh, showing that that would be the ideal way to preserve organs in 1935. And that hasn't really been achieved uh, until now. And um, my fellow uh, Schiffer and, and Jonathan Young and a number of fellows working in our research laboratory have worked to develop and fine tune the system that we call the Toronto Ex Vivo system. And what this does is we place the lungs in a, a bubble or a, a chamber and the, the lungs are perfused with a pump system and an artificial lung that is run backwards. So we put an oxygen, a, a, a gas on it that has very low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. And the, and the fluid going into the lungs has this mixture and the lung's job is to remove the carbon dioxide and take oxygen into the solution. So we ventilate the lungs with a standard ventilator and by doing this, we have a continuous system where the lung is delivered fluid with high CO2, low oxygen, 
and this puts the oxygen in and takes out the CO2 and we can measure the function over time. We can measure the compliance of the lung, the ability to expand. We can measure the resistance in the vessels, which is a, a measure of injury. And what this does is it allows us to support the metabolism, provide nutrients, provide the, a, a, a low stress, protective strategy for the lungs. And this is what we've learned over the years in, in the concept of how do you protect the lung from ventilator injury, how do you protect the lung from low blood pressure, how do you protect the lung in sepsis. We put everything together that we know, knew was good for a lung and tried to, to develop a system that would do that but also allow us to monitor the organ over time. What we developed is a system to keep the lungs outside the body at, at normal temperature. And I'd like to show you the video because it is, it is very cool for those of you that haven't seen it and is beyond our wildest imaginations of what I ever thought I'd be doing in my career. But the important thing uh, of this slide here is that w what we showed, if you look at the top row, is for 12 hours we've kept lungs outside the body at normal body temperature, and this has never been done before. And then you transplant the lung, and the lungs perform normally with a, with a very good oxygenation after transplantation. This is in Cape. This is my fellowship of this last year uh, in 2008. And this was a remarkable achievement because it was something that uh, had eluded us in our ability to, to keep lungs outside the body. And we looked at some of the issues of how to run these systems without putting blood cells in them. And then compared it to our current best technique, the, the Perfidex, uh, when you store lungs for 24 hours outside the body, the Perfidex provides reasonable function but not fantastic. With 12 hours of EGRP, you ex vivo lung perfusion, you start to get better lung function. And what we have done is we've, we've uh, started to look at ways to repair the lungs. I mentioned IL-10, the cytokine that decreases the inflammation and can modify the immune system after transplantation. And what we did this year was, or actually last year, was we showed that that technique that we had originally shown that Fowler Martin showed in pigs, that, that we could genetically modify the donor lung, we took human uh, donor lungs that were damaged that could not be used for transplantation and, and we were able to uh, show that we could increase IL-10 in human lungs over time and if you look at cold lungs, nothing happens in the cold as we've shown before. So really bringing it up to normal body temperature allows you to bring the lung uh, to, to allow, allows you to repair the lung. We showed that you could improve the oxygenation of these damaged lungs. These were the IL-10 gene therapy treated lungs, again, human lungs, and that you could improve the vascular resistance, again, a function of the lungs. And this just shows that all of the injury pattern that, we, that exists in the donor lung, we can turn around and make these lungs transplantable. Another important thing that we showed is that we are actually facilitating the recovery of the lung. I told you about that barrier between the air and the blood side in the lung. In life, between every cell in our lung, there's a sort of mortar, which is a ZO1 protein that prevents fluid from leaking through between the cells. And that's one of the injuries that happens in, in the, in the uh, transplanted lung when it's damaged in transplantation. And that mortar between the cells is this green line that you see here. In, in normal lung, the, the, it's on the edge of lung cells. And after 12 hours of cold storage, the weasel ray is still there. It's starting to disintegrate. But after 24 hours, you see it totally disappear. But with the ex vivo lung perfusion, you can see that the, the mortar or the ZO1 is, is preserved and it's starting to recover so that you have a more normal pattern of the actual structure of the lung after you transplant it. And this is the work from uh, Marcello's paper again. This is in human lungs. In this slide, the ZO1 is, is brown stained. And we can show that the damaged lung had a very higgledy piggledy pattern of staining of ZO1. And, and after we treated them in the ex vivo system, you start to see the normal pattern of recovery of the actual structure in that very important mortar between the cells of the lung. 